forward to the cloud. Vanya, I presume you're in Hawaii or something? I wish, I wish. I, I think I cannot even yet travel to the States. No. Nope. Okay, because... No, November. Sorry. Yeah. November. Do you want me to start on time or should I wait another minute, Vanya? Well, you're the boss. Uh, I'll wait one more minute, see if people show up. I love her. Okay. I'm in my office actually in Edinburgh. Yeah, but it's good. It's good. Almost as Hawaii. <laughs> a, bit, a bit more rainy. No, no, no. The, the weather is similar. It's constant through the year. Yeah. <laughs> like in Hawaii. <laughs> All right, great. Let me begin. It's a pleasure to have Richard Thomas today speak on higher rank DT theory from abelian DT, non abelian DT theory from abelian DT theory. Yeah, sorry. I think I changed the title. Okay. So I'm going to talk about joint work with Sahela Faisbach, who's incredible. And uh, there's four papers on the archive, actually, uh, doing different things. I'll describe some of them. So the plan um, is to first describe DT invariants, so classical ones, and then Joyce Song's uh, generalized ones. Um, and then explain the rough idea of the whole talk, which is how to express rank RDT theory in terms of lower rank. And I'll give an example which works perfectly. So the other examples work, um, work are much harder. Um, there's lots of corrections. But when you start with rank one sheaves and pass to rank zero, it works extremely well with no other corrections. And the formula is extremely clean. So even though in some sense it's it's not what we want to do in this project. I, I will describe that example because it works very nicely. And then I'll show how starting with rank R, you can get all the way down to not rank one because you get down to rank one and rank zero, unfortunately, because of this less equals here. Uh, but you can get from rank R all the way down to rank zero. Okay, and then I'll explain some of the technicalities, a very brief overview of it. Um, which are weak stability conditions of Bayer, Macri, Stellari, and Toda, and wall crossing. So I'll explain how that goes. And then finally, I'll show how you go from rank zero to rank minus one. So actually complexes of sheaves of rank minus one. And from that, it's rather easy to get to rank one by dualizing these complexes and shifting them. Okay. And some preliminaries, I'm always going to be on a Clabia threefold, although everything in this talk works on a Fano, uh, in fact, any threefold, smooth over the complex numbers, projective, except the wall crossing formula. But Joyce has a new wall crossing formula, which probably applies to Fano threefolds as well. But for now, we're going to be on a Clabia threefold. Uh, we're going to fix an ample line bundle. That's just for stability, to define stability. And it, we're going to assume our threefold satisfies the bogomolov gizika conjecture or inequality of Bayer-Macri-Toda, okay, which I'll describe later. But as an example, the quintic threefold satisfies this conjecture in enough cases for us to push our program through and for all the results to hold. Uh, and I beg your pardon. There's one thing I should have remembered to say on this slide here which is that rank one DT invariance, so the, the interest in getting to rank one and describing things in terms of rank one DT invariance is that they, they essentially count curves on your Calabi R threefold. So they're, they're conjecturally at least equivalent to gromov witten invariance, but I will explain that later on. Okay, so these are the preliminaries. We fix the churn character and then we're interested, DT theory basically is about counting sheaves of this fixed churn character C. And we're going to consider semi-stable bundles or sheaves or complexes of sheaves in this class C. And there's a bunch of notions of stability. And the ones we actually use will be unfamiliar to you, unless you're Bayer, Macri, 
uh, Stellari Artoda, but uh, that doesn't matter. You should think about things like slope stability and Giesecke stability. So um, they could all be written in terms of some complex number, or in other words, two real numbers, a real and an imaginary part, such as rank and degree. So for instance, <coughs> oh no, let me just finish this. So then you can take the slope of this complex number uh, and that will be what we call the slope of our sheaf or complex of sheaves. So for instance, ah, I've forgotten the order I wrote this. Okay, and then we will say, right, so I will give some examples in a minute, but they will define using just topological quantities, just using the churn character of E, they will define a notion of slope for each sheaf E, and then we will say that E is semi-stable if and only if every subsheaf has lower slope, essentially. Okay. Um, so there's the precise definition there. And in the actual stability conditions we use, they will really work in the derived category rather than the abelian category of coherent sheaves. And so the notion of sub, like a subsheaf, is not usually what you expect it to be. So in particular, this subsheaf in an appropriate stability condition on the derived category might just be an arbitrary sheaf mapping to E, and that might be an injection in a certain abelian category, but not the usual one of coherent sheaves. But you don't worry about that for now. For now, you should just think of subsheaves. Okay, so here's the example I should have given before. So for instance, you can take the rank of a sheaf and its degree, so just the first churn class measured against the hyperplane class. And the quotient of them is the usual notion of Mumford slope of a vector bundle. And then this gives a notion of slope stability. So a sheaf is slope stable if uh, for all subsheaves F, the slope of the subsheaf is less than the slope of the quotient sheaf, which is close to saying the slope of the subsheaf is less than the slope of E. There's a, there's a tiny technical difficulty that we won't go into. And another one is, this is a bit artificial, but you could also uh, take Giesecke stability, where you, again, you take the rank as your denominator and your numerator is roughly the thing which via Riemann rock corresponds to the number of sections of E when you twist up by a large N. But it's not quite that. You, you throw away two to the leading two terms. The first leading term is the rank. The next term then you throw away. Um, is this correct? No. I beg your pardon? You throw away just the leading term according to the rank, and then you get this polynomial here. OK, but there, there's, uh, there's, if you think about the first example, you won't go far wrong. That's the standard notion of Mumford slope stability. OK, but um, DT invariants usually were defined using Giesecke stability. And moreover, initially, uh, they were when D and T were involved, uh, there was this assumption that there are no strict, strictly semi-stable sheaves because strictly semi-stable sheaves have automorphism groups. And um, how to handle those is very complicated. So in the initial assumption is that whenever you have a semi-stable sheaf, it's automatically stable. So let, let's assume we're in that situation for this slide, and then we'll drop that assumption shortly after. Um, then you can define an invariant counting stable sheaves in this fixed class. And roughly speaking, here are some details for those of you who are for the virtual cyclists amongst you, uh, but you don't really need these details and they're not really the subject of this talk. But the moduli space is a projective scheme with something called a perfect obstruction theory of virtual dimension zero. And uh, what, what that means in practice is that there are you know, we understand that deformations of a sheaf are governed by X1 EE, or it's, maybe it's trace-free part. Uh, if you've got bundles, this is just H1 of the endomorphisms of E. And um, obstructions are then given by the X2 group. And on a Calabi-R threefold, these two groups are dual to each other by said duality. And there are no higher obstructions. For instance, X3, 
phase three is dual to HOM, and this vanishes by the stability condition because E is stable, it hasn't, all its automorphisms are just scalars. Um, and that means, that means it has a perfect obstruction theory and that means it has a virtual cycle. Um, so as I say, that's, that's a subject for another talk. Um, but uh, this is more a, a quote for when I give this talk to physicists, that this is closely related to the fact that holomorphic bundles are critical points of a certain function on an infinite dimensional space. And you expect critical points of a function to appear in dimension zero and um, for Morse theory reasons. So the, you're taking the zeros of a one form, D of this function on some infinite dimensional space and using it to do something like compute the Euler characteristic of that infinite dimensional space. And that's the invariant. But what you should think of it as, so if you know nothing about what I just said, you should think of this invariant as being the topological Euler characteristic of the moduli space, possibly with a sign due to this duality. All right, and you won't go far wrong. It isn't the topological Euler characteristic. That would not be a deformation invariant, but it's very close to being, it morally is. And in fact, Behren showed that every point of moduli space carries a certain multiplicity, a certain integer, which tells you how you should think of as, for instance, if your point is a fat point in moduli space, so it's a zero dimensional Artinian point of the moduli space, then this multiplicity is just the, the length of the local ring. So it tells you how fat the point is. And it tells you what that point should count as. And if you count your points of moduli space with this bare end multiplicity, then that is the DT invariant. So the weighted Euler characteristic of moduli space weighted by this multiplicity function is the DT invariant. So this was proved sort of 10 years later, but it's a good way to think about the DT invariant. So, but uh, for the purposes of this talk, you should just think of it as the Euler characteristic of the moduli space. If the moduli space is smooth, then this bare end function is just a constant. It's given by this sign here. And so uh, you get this formula. All right. So, but roughly speaking, you should think of a DT invariant as the Euler characteristic of the moduli space. It's slightly more sophisticated version which makes sure that it's deformation invariant. So if I deform the Calabi Yau a little bit, the complex structure on it, then this, the moduli space will change, but this number will not. And then generalized DT invariants are supposed to, um, they will do count sheaves, which are possibly strictly semi-stable. So we drop this condition that semi-stability implies stability. And things here are much more complicated because every time you have a stable object, you can take all its direct sums and extensions with itself and other stable objects of the same slope to get semi-stable objects with huge automorphism groups. And you know, if we're continuing this Euler characteristic analogy from here, what a sheaf with all automorphism group G should count as is one over the Euler characteristic of G, but the topolo topological Euler characteristic of a, of a group is, um, or a reductive group is zero, so that's not good. So you have these problems, but what you should do is you should think about this process that I said here of taking all stable objects and taking their direct sums. So you take an E and you think of forming E plus E and E plus E plus E, those all have an action of the symmetric group. So when you divide by the length of that symmetric group, that becomes an n factorial. So this maybe looks like some kind of ex exponential. Or if you think of that E plus, e, you know, n copies of E has automorphism group GLNC, whose vial group is the symmetric group. Um, then for, for various reasons like that, you should think of this as some kind of exponential, this operation here. And so um, Joyce and Kinsevich Soiberman found a way of sort of inverting it by taking something called a logarithm in the whole algebra of coherent sheaves of fixed slope. 
Uh, and by doing this, they get more controllable automorphism groups. So again, that's for another lecture by other speakers. But in this way, Joyce and Song were able to define a generalized invariant counting semi-stable sheaves. But it's no longer an integer. It's a rational number. And it's no longer quite just the Euler characteristic of the moduli space, but um, it can be defined. And it reduces to the usual DT invariant, roughly the Euler characteristic of moduli space, when there's no strictly semi-stable sheaves. And Kinsevich Soberman defined more elaborate, more sophisticated objects, which refine these numbers. So motives, Laurent polynomials, and all kinds of things. <coughs> um, and their theory was slightly more conjectural. Uh, but those conjectures have all been proved now. So probably, probably all this work that I'm going to describe applies to Kinsevich Soberman theory as well. Because they have a wall crossing formula in their setting as well. Uh, but I'm going to talk about Joyce Song today. So I'm only going to talk about DT invariants counting semi stable sheaves, and stable and semi stable sheaves. So these are rational numbers. And they're invariant under deformations of the Calabi Arms complex structure. But what they're not invariant under is changing the stability conditions. So as we change the line bundle or the Kähler form or whatever we use to define stability, then what can happen is that there's a wall and chamber structure on the space of stability conditions. And when we cross a wall, as we move in a chamber, nothing happens. And then as we cross a wall, the big insight of Joyce and Kasevich Soberman is that there's a, a very controlled wall crossing formula which tells you how the invariants change. And that'll be the key tool that we use. So are there any questions? We're okay. Okay, so here's this key tool in a toy model. So suppose you have a bundle or a sheaf sitting in an exact sequence like this. This is the simplest possible case where A and B are stable and that we're gonna vary the stability condition. So maybe the polarization or the, the uh, Kähler form so that the slopes of A and B cross. So on the wall, the slope of A equals the slope of B. This is the wall in the space of Kähler forms or in the ample cone or tensor Q or something. Um, on the wall, the slopes of A and B are the same. Below the wall, the slope of A is less than the slope of B. So this exact sequence here does not destabilize F. And above the wall, the slope of A is bigger than the slope of B, so then it does destabilize F, okay? So just below the wall, F is stable. Just above the wall, it's destabilized. So we lose F from the moduli space, but we gain extensions in the opposite direction. Okay, so on crossing the wall, we lose the extensions between B and A, these Fs here. And the automorphisms of A and B ensure that actually you end up projectivizing these extensions. Okay. Um, and you gain the extensions in the opposite direction. All right. So what happens if we just fix A and B for now, or imagine they're rigid, later we'll bury A and B. Okay. But if you fix A and B, then what's happened is that the Euler characteristic of my moduli space, or this part of the moduli space made out of extensions in this direction or the opposite direction. The Euler characteristic has changed as I cross the wall. I've lost the Euler characteristic of this projective space. Well, the Euler characteristic of Pn is n plus one. So I've lost this quantity. X, little x1 is the dimension of big x1. And I've gained this quantity here. Okay, and in the Calabi R threefold case, so these X'd ones, I have no control over. They're jumping around all over the place. But in the Calabi-R threefold case, this X'd one is dual to this X2. And this is now an Euler characteristic because there are no other X's. There's no Homs between B and A because A and B have the same slope on the wall. And so uh, they can't, stable objects of the same slope can't have any Homs between them unless they're isomorphic. 
Uh, therefore, there's no x3s by said duality. There's no x minus ones, so there's no x4s and so on. So these are the only x groups between A and B. And so this is the alternating sum of all the x groups between A and B. So this is given by a topological Riemann rock quantity. This is called the Mukai pairing between A and B. Okay, so e even though what we lose we can't control and what we gain we can't control, their difference we have complete control over is governed by a topological quantity in A and B. And so what you find is that the invariant above the wall is equal to the invariant below the wall plus the change that I just calculated, that's this chi B A here, we're ignoring the sign, so let's ignore it. And then we can vary A and B and we do this, I, I've just computed the Euler characteristic of some fiber over the moduli space of A and Bs. So then we sort of integrate over the A and Bs or take Euler characteristic over A and Bs. And that gives us the DT invariant of A times the DT invariant of B. All right, so if you just take this very naive Euler characteristic approach, uh, this is the formula you get because Euler characteristic has this magnificent property that the Euler characteristic of one space mapping to another is given by the Euler characteristic of the image, the base, weighted by the Euler characteristics of the fibers. And this theorem, they prove, is true in this setting, even if you use proper DT invariants, not just topological Euler characteristics. So are there any questions about that formula? Because it's kind of important. It's the key tool in the whole talk. So that's the simplest wall crossing formula. And then general sheaves, when they become unstable, they'll have more complicated filtrations than this. They'll have things called Harder and Narasimhan and Jordan Holder filtrations. So they'll be destabilized by you know, filtrations with many pieces, many graded pieces. All right, so what you should think of here is that F is splitting into A and B as we cross the wall, and that's reflected in this quadratic term, J, A, J, B. When F can split into more complicated pieces, like three pieces, four pieces, then you get cubic terms, quartic terms, and so on. So you get a more complicated formula, but it always has the same shape. The coefficients are topological, universal coefficients. And then you get essentially a polynomial in lower order DT invariants. And what do I mean by lower? Here it's clear A and B have lesser, smaller rank than F. So you get kind of lower order terms in some sense. And the whole game in this project is to make sense of what lower order terms means. To get some quantity which gets smaller at each stage, each time you cross a wall and you generate all this shrapnel, all these pieces fly off. You want to know those pieces are smaller in some sense, so you can do an induction. In this example, it's very easy. You just use rank. The rank gets smaller, but that's because I'm in the abelian categories. I'm going to have to work in a more complicated abelian category later on, and then it's not, it's harder to get such a quantity. It gets smaller at each step. Okay, so that's yeah, there's one or two main slides. That's one of them. Are there any questions about that? So that's the wall crossing formula. And then this is the other main slide. Is it, what is the main idea? So how are we going to get? How are we going to understand rank R D T invariants in terms of lower rank? So it's in the following way. First, we twist up our sheaves by a hugely positive line model to assume that they have no higher cohomology. And then we just fix this n. <coughs> so more or less up to other wall crossings, that doesn't change the invariance. So you can ignore that. Uh, but now what we do is we consider sections of our sheaves and their co-kernels. All right. So obviously the co-kernel of a section has rank one lower. So we replace our E's by F's and they have slow, lower rank. And we know what their churn character is. OK, it's given by a nice formula. To a first approximation for the rest of this slide, pretend um, that everything here is stable. So if E is stable, then and S is non-zero, let's pretend that the co-kernel is also stable. 
Generically, this happens. In real life, it doesn't, but let's pretend. Conversely, if you have a stable F and an extension by this line bundle here, let's suppose the result is also stable. Okay. Then what you find is that the Fs are basically the same data as the Es and the Ss. All right. So given a, a sheaf E and a section, I get an F by taking co kernel. But conversely, if I take a sheaf of this churn character, what you find by deformation theory is that, roughly speaking, it's of this form. It comes from, it, it is the co-kernel of a section of a certain bundle. Okay, I can reconstruct E and this section from F. All right, that's a, that comes down to the fact that N is huge. So that's just some analysis. You can believe me for now. So what you find is that the moduli space of Fs is a projective bundle over the moduli space of Es, okay? And the project, the fibers are just the, the sections of E, okay? This, the fiber is the um, projectivization of the space of sections of E. So it project, it's the projective space on this vector space. Okay, so N is the dimension of this space here. It's the holomorphic Euler characteristic of E. So it's topological. Okay, so what we get is that the DT invariant counting Fs, well, it's just a PN minus one bundle over moduli space. So when you take Euler characteristics, you find it's just the Euler characteristic of that PN minus one times the DT invariant of the base. So, the, so roughly speaking, the number of Fs is capital N times the number of Es. And that analysis can be done properly and that's then a true formula, modulo this first approximation, this lie about stability, okay? And then the correct formula will have more complicated terms to do with, you know, when the co-kernel of S isn't stable, for instance, um, or when S factors through some destabilizing subsheaf of E. So if E is semi-stable, then it will have a, a subsheaf um, of the same slope. And if S factors through that, then things get complicated. Okay, and so then I'll give uh, correction terms to this. And it, But maybe you can see already, this looks a little bit like it has the same sort of shape as the wall crossing formula I had before because there's topological quantities and DT merits. Um, you'll see why that is soon. You'll see this is a wall crossing formula. Um, but anyway, we're going to have to use wall crossing formula to handle the fact that actually the co-kernel isn't stable. Um, and given an F, if you manage to produce an E, it might not be stable. So there'll be higher order corrections to this formula. <coughs> but what we'll observe is or the, the, the starting point for this project is that there is a stability condition. These weak stability conditions, which I'll get onto by a McCree Toda, are basically built, just they're just perfect for complexes like this two term complex made out of this section. So there is a stability condition almost by design in which this two term complex is stable. In other words, because it's quasi isomorphic to its cohomology F, there is a stability condition in which F is stable. It just isn't Giesecke stability. And so what you'll find, what we'll find is some, you know, this formula will basically hold in a certain stability condition. And then we will wall cross to get to Giesecke stability or something close to it called tilt stability. Um, and that will produce lots of corrections, this formula. And then we'll get the true formula. So any questions about that? Is the rough idea clear? So the only thing to notice about this is that if this formula were true, we'd be done. It would express DT invariance and rank R in terms of DT invariance in rank R minus one. We could just do it R minus one times and we get DT invariance in rank one. But that's not going to hold because there'll be other correction terms and actually we'll end up getting down to rank one plus rank zero. 
which will complicate matters. Okay, but here's an example where actually the uh, first approximation works perfectly, is rank one. So let's take rank one sheaves. Um, up to tensoring by line bundle, they're all ideal sheaves on this threefold. Ideal sheaves of subschemes of dimension less equal one, so curves and points. So MC is actually a Hilbert scheme. And uh, the corresponding DT invariant is, uh, just counts curves or curves and points in, in this class of Z. All right, now in this case, if you twist up and take a section, what is that? Well, if you have a section of this ideal sheaf twisted by ON, that obviously gets you a section by including the ideal sheaf in the structure sheaf, that gets you a section of ON. Okay, so it gives you a divisor of degree n in your x. That's the first thing it gives you. But the fact that this section of ON, this divisor, actually comes from a section that lives in the ideal sheaf of z means that z lies in your divisor. That's what this data means here. Okay, and then so this the data of a section is the same thing as the data of a divisor in this linear system containing the Z. All right, and then what it works out is that the F, the co-kernel, turns out to be a torsion sheaf, so a rank zero sheaf supported away only on the divisor, zero away from the divisor, and on the divisor is the ideal sheaf of Z on the divisor. Okay, so you take the ideal sheaf of Z on the divisor, push it forward to X, and that's your sheaf. And in this case, in one of our earlier papers listed on the first slide, it turns out that everything is true that you could ever hope for. So for N large enough, um, firstly, all these ideal sheaves are always stable. Giesecke stable, slope stable, any stable you like. All these co-kernels are stable, and they're the only stable sheaves. You, you can't find any stable sheaves in the same churn character as F, which aren't of this form. So that's some kind of miracle, and it's only true because N is huge. So in particular, imagine one of these divisors being twice another divisor, so being non-reduced. Then you... That's fine, this is still true. You can get the push forward of line bundles from that divisor or ideal sheaves from that divisor. So they're rank one sheaves on this twice thickened divisor. But you might imagine, well, what about taking a rank two sheaf on the thin divisor on half of D? The statement, the claim here is that that will always be unstable if it's third churn class, so if, it's topological invariants equal those of F, okay? More or less its third churn class will be just too small or too big, I'm not sure if it was stable. Anyway, that, that would, this, this is a surprising result, but it turns out to be true for N large enough in this churn character, these are all the sheaves, these are all the stable sheaves. So what you find is the moduli space of these rank zero sheaves F, is a projective bundle over the moduli space of these rank one sheaves. That's this Hilbert scheme. Okay, so what, what is this Pn minus one bundle? It's just remember MC parameterizes these Zs, these subschemes Z, and then MCN parameterizes these pairs of the subscheme Z and a divisor containing it. Okay, so this some typical incidence thing gives you a really smooth Pn minus one bundle. And so what you find in this case is that the invariant counting the rank zero sheaves is really equivalent to the invariant counting the rank one sheaves. Okay, so this is the statement I made before. Okay. And uh, just very briefly, these invariants, these DT invariants in class C, so counting these Zs here, um, are actually, they count curves and points in X. And by the MNOP conjecture of Malik, Nekrasov, Akunkov, Pandra, Panda, they can be written in terms of a very universal formula, a known universal formula in terms of the Gromov-Witten invariance of X. 
That conjecture is proved now for most Calabi-Yau threefolds, in particular the quintic threefold. Um, so that's the right-hand side of this formula that we derived. N is a topological quantity. On the left-hand side, counting these rank zero sheaves, these are actually, the generating series of these counts are conjectured to be modular forms, vector valued mock modular forms actually, by something called S-duality in physics. There's some references for you, thank you, Um, And if there's time at the end, actually in this talk, there won't be, um, in uh, Rahul's Gromov Witten seminar, I made sure there was time, but um, to discuss the, this, this ought to have applications which have yet to be exploited in Gromov Witten theory, because we're saying something equivalent to Gromov Witten invariance can be written in terms of something which is supposed to be governed by modularity. And uh, we have a, a conjectural Noah to Lefschetz point of view suggested by Damesh Manlik um, on how, why this is true and how to prove it, but it's, it's an awful long way from being mathematics. Uh, so I probably won't have time to go into that, but uh, there should be something interesting there. It hasn't yet been exploited, but there's lots and lots of difficulties with it, but it's an interesting thing for the future. Okay, but what the talk's really supposed to be about is starting with rank R and getting down to eventually rank minus one or, or one. Um, but the easiest thing to do is to go from rank R to rank zero. Okay, so we end up writing rank R in minutes in terms of rank R minus one and lower. And the result is the following. We end up, so this is, I think the second paper listed on the first slide, we end up showing that the DT invariant, any given DT invariant in rank R can be written as a universal polynomial in DT invariants in lower rank, uh, sorry, in rank zero. So these are all count sheaves of rank zero and actually pure dimension two. So they're like, they're like the ones on the previous slide. They always count sheaves which are supported on surfaces in the threefold. And there's countably many of these terms, but only sort of finitely many of them contribute to this formula. Okay, so then what's left is to express everything in terms of rank one. And uh, I come back to that later. But what most of the, the rest of the talk is gonna be about is how we prove this, how we get from rank R to rank R minus one and below and then inductively, therefore, to rank zero. Any questions before I start on the uh, stability conditions? Okay, so uh, there's these miracle weak stability conditions of biomachry of Toda, which Sahel is the world expert in. Um, and they're a bit technical and really, you're either an expert or you're not going to absorb this. I mean, for instance, I haven't entirely absorbed it. But anyway, they pro they're going to depend, or the ones we use are going to depend on two parameters, B and W. We're going to work in the following abelian category of two term complexes of sheaves. <coughs> Excuse me. With conditions on the slopes of their uh, cohomologies, the cohomology sheaves of this complex, so the kernel and the co-kernel. So this is something called a tilt of the usual abelian category of coherent sheaves. But again, that's for another talk. Okay, there is, I think either you've seen this kind of thing or you haven't, there is some kind of abelian category that we work in. It uses two term complexes. And that's extremely important to us because we're going to, you'll see, we're going to need two term complexes. But in this category are various sheaves. For instance, when D is injective, then this complex is quasi isomorphic to just its co kernel. And so you, you certainly get in this category sheaves um, whose co kernel has all of its uh, harder Narasimov factors having slope bigger than B. Okay. And then there's a certain central charge, so and therefore a slope. And again, 
the formula won't help you in any way, but it's topological, just like the Mumford slope. It depends only on the churn character of E and these parameters B and W. And then we're going to vary B and W, and that's going to give us um, our space of stability conditions and wall crossing. Okay. And then again, technically, we need this bogomolov giesecke inequality. And that is an upper bound on the third churn character of objects which are semi-stable with respect to this slope here in this crazy abelian category here. So the abelian category just tells us what it means to have a sub-object. Okay, so we can test stability by using this slope. Okay, and there's the inequality. Again, you should you shouldn't try and absorb it. But uh, if you're familiar with the usual Bogomolov inequality, um, the analogy is rather clear. So the usual Bogomolov inequality says that slopes semi-stable sheaves, they have a certain bound on their second churn character. Even though slope, the power of that is that slope only uses the first churn character or the first churn class of the sheaf. But once you have stability, you get a bound on the second churn class. This is a similar thing where our notion of slope here uses only the second churn up to the second churn character of E. But once you're semi-stable, you can generally have a bound on the third churn character. Okay. Um, and it's a sufficient condition. It was invented by these guys in order to get the existence of Bridgeland stability conditions, which we're not going to use. Um, and it has, for that reason, people work on it, and it, it has now been proved for certain Calabria threefolds. Okay, in particular, quintic threefolds. All right. But here's how it goes. Okay, what we do is we plot. So we're going to, I'm going to show you what this wall crossing looks like. We're going to plot certain data of our sheaves, the, this ratio of the, the degree of the sheaf, so the first churn class divided by the rank, and the second churn class, we're going to plot that data on the same axes that we're going to plot the B and W. Okay, and the way this type of stability works out, just believe me, is the following. Okay, so here's the picture. The shaded area is where W is bigger than B squared over two. That was our condition for a stability condition. So you have to be in inside the parabola to get one of these stability conditions. The Bogomolov inequality basically implies that the this topological quantity, this pi of E for semi-stable objects E is outside the parabola. All right. And then what happens is, <coughs> let's suppose that E gets destabilized on some wall. What does that mean? That means uh, let this destabilizing object be F. What that means is if you draw the straight line joining pi of E and pi of F, then your B and W, your stability condition, will be on that straight line. And anywhere on that line, if B and W lie anywhere on that line, the slope of F will be equal to the slope of E, and it will actually be equal to the slope of this straight line. That's the way it works. That's how everything's chosen. And when B and W are maybe below that line, E might be stable, and above that line, it'll be unstable because F will have destabilized it. So that's roughly what's going on. And then this is what happens. So there's a region in the space of stability conditions below which there are no stable objects in my um, churn class. Okay, so I'm actually going to, I'm doing the analysis here for the Fs, the co-kernel of my Joyce Song pairs, um, the co-kernel of my section of E. Okay, although I haven't got an E or an F yet, but anyway, I'm just going to work in that churn class and you'll see where the E's and the Fs come in. All right, so in that particular churn character, by applying this bogomolov giesecke inequality to that particular churn character, you get a region where nothing can be, that inequality is violated. Therefore, there can be no semi-stable objects down here. Okay, so the invariance is zero down here, so that's simple enough to understand. 
here is my churn character or it's pi so any wall of instability for it is a straight line going through this point then i have a finite number of walls then i have a special wall which i'll come to in a second then i have another finite number of walls and then i have something called the large volume chamber so bridgeland proved that in large volume and by Macrito and Stellari, prove that in large volume, um, we understand stability. Up here, stable objects are all sheaves, and they're damn nearly Giesecke stable. They're somewhere in between Giesecke and slope stability, something called tilt, tilt stability. So if you're Julius or another expert, if you're taking the um, Hilbert polynomial of a sheaf, um, if you, so the leading terms are given by the rank, the second term is what gives you slope stability, all the remaining terms give you Giesecke stability. If instead you take two terms, so the slope and the next one down, that's something called tilt stability. And that's something that's close enough to, I mean, that's to, there you're dealing with semi-stable sheaves and so on. And you're so close to Giesecke stability that it becomes rather easy to use the wall crossing formula to express tilt semi-stable counts in terms of Giesecke semi-stable counts and vice versa. So more or less, once we've got up here, we're done. All right, so what we want to do is analyze the DT invariant counting sheaves in this class. So this is the Fs as before. Down here we get a zero. Up here we get what we expect. And we want to see what happens as we cross the walls. And this is the wall where the, the line bundle OX minus N that I used to map to E to give my Fs has the same phase as my class CN, all right, on this wall. So let me tell you what happens on this wall. So on this wall, the red wall, which is the important one, <coughs> that's where F gets destabilized, not by O minus one N, not by the line bundle, but by a shift in the drive category. So this is where we really get complexes. All right, and, and they're complexes which look very much like the exact sequence that we started with several slides ago. They're actually a rotation of that in the drive category. So in the drive category, you can, you know, do what you do in cohomology and move this O minus N up here by some connecting homomorphism and get something called an exact triangle. This exact triangle is what's happening on that Joyce Song wall. So on that red wall, F, has the same slope as this guy and the co the co cone of this map here or the kernel in that that crazy abelian category i'm working on in is e okay so so i get short exact sequences in that abelian category this is why we work in that crazy abelian category so you should think of this as a short exact sequence of sheaves but it isn't it's kind of equivalent to one up here, but that would look like it might be destabilizing E. That's not what's happening. This surjection from E to F actually can destabilize F. You can think of this surjection as being a subobject. E is a subobject of F in this crazy abelian category. Okay. And as we cross the wall, the this is the kind of destabilization which to first order happens to objects of class CN. Okay, so below the wall, F is destabilized by this. Above the wall, it's not. Roughly, what it turns out is the precise statement is um, F is stable if and only if E, made from this morphism here and by taking cocoa, is uh, semi-stable. And the section, so the connecting homomorphism of this triangle, so it's this guy here, doesn't factor through any semi-destabilizing subsheaf. You can ignore that. Okay, but the, the point is the wall crossing, as we go across the red wall, does the following. It says, the DT invariant above the wall in the class of the Fs equals the DT invariant below the wall, plus, usual sign, um, N is the number of the Mukai pairing saying the Riemann-Roch formula for extensions from here to here, plus higher order times by the DT invariants 
of E and the DT invariant of this shifted line bundle. Okay, so do you remember the wall crossing formula that we started with many slides ago? Let me quickly go back to it. This is this is bad form, isn't it? Okay, this wall crossing formula, the invariant above the wall is the invariant below the wall plus the topological quantity counting extensions between A and B and between B and A. So this Mukai pairing times the number of A's times the number of B's. All right, let's go and do it here in this crazy abelian category. It's the same. DT invariant above the wall is DT invariant below the wall plus the number of extensions between E, the two pieces, the A and the B, the E and this shifted line bundle, and vice versa times by the DT invariant counting the E's, that's this, that's the DT invariant in class C, uh, times the DT invariant of this, but this line bundle is rigid, it sits on its own in moduli space, and it counts as one, so I just times by one there, all right? Um, and so uh, this N here, remember, is the number of extensions from this O minus N shift by one to E. But that, if you work out what it is, is just the number of HOMs from O minus N to E. So that really is the Euler characteristic of the projective space of sections of E twisted by N. So this, this wall crossing formula really is the formula that um, I gave you in the rough idea section slide much earlier on. So this is just counting the number of sections here. And then there are lower order terms. Finally, we start to see them dot, 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 because this approximation here assumes that the E's and the F's are always stable, and they might not be. In particular, if your section factors through a destabilizing subsheaf, then you shouldn't count it. So you have to subtract off terms. So you, you get some kind of inclusion, exclusion, some where you have to put in more and more terms, but they all come from the wall crossing, from more and more complicated destabilizing filtrations of F. All right, and the, the, but the key thing is, they also, they come from destabilizing subsheaves of E, which are all therefore of lower rank, so we can induct on rank. So they, these dot, dot, dot here, we have some control over what we mean by that they're lower order terms. They have lower rank, so that's good. Okay, and now we take this formula, and we will all cross this term, this was counting sheaves below the Joyceong wall. We wall cross that down to below the BG wall. I'll show you the picture again. Okay, so we take the, we wall cross from just below this red line all the way down to here, where the invariant becomes zero because there's no semi-stable sheaves there. Okay, so eventually this will become zero. But each time, each time we do a wall crossing, some shrapnel will be generated. All right, but we will try and control that and show its lower order terms in some sense. So this will become just dot, dot, dot. This will become small. All the other terms we will cross up to the large volume chamber. So this will become again up to lower order terms and shrapnel, which we'll control. This will become the number of sheaves in class CN. So this will become the number of Fs. And this will become the number of sheaves in class C. So this will become the number of E's. And so what we'll have is a formula which expresses sheaves of rank R in terms of sheaves of rank R minus one plus lower order terms, dot, 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 the shrapnel. And then the technical aspects of the proof are that all we can control all these for further wall crossings and show they only involve sheaves. Okay, so the only, the only wall crossing which involves complexes is this Joyce Song wall here, this crazy exact triangle. Okay, so because they only involve sheaves, the rank drops at each stage. And so we can we have some control and we can talk about them being of lower order terms. 
but really the rank doesn't strictly drop. It might stay the same because the pieces I split into might have, one of them might be rank zero and the other one might have the same rank. So we need something more and that's given by something called the discriminant. And it turns out this also decreases every time you, and this strictly decreases um, each time you cross a wall. And so that gives us another quantity to induct on. So inducting on rank and this discriminant, it turns this formula that we had on the previous page into what I said, you know, that we, we take this term here up to the large volume limit. We take this one down to below the bogomolov kiesiker wall, so it becomes zero. This one, become, again, we take up to the large volume limit. And then we get all this shrapnel. So there's many more dots in this formula than there were in this formula. But all, the, all those dots have lower rank. And then a final further wall crossing passes from this large volume limit to Giesecke stability. And so we end up showing that we've written the DT invariant counting Giesecke semi-stable sheaves in class C. That's roughly here in terms of DT invariants of lower rank sheaves. So that's this is the rank R minus one piece and then dot, dot, dot to the other lower rank pieces. And that's the structure of the argument. The, the true details about how we get this control and show that um, apart from on the Joyce song wall, you only get sheaves and on the Joyce song wall, you only get the simplest possible complexes of this form. That is, uh, that's very technical and hard to do. And um, a lot of it has to do with the fact that this, um, these lines here, that they spend a long time in this parabola. This distance, if you take one of these lines and you look at the distance from where it intersects the parabola on the left to where it intersects on the right, that's huge. It depends on N and it's, it's large, you know, it's like N squared or something, okay? And what, what you find if you're familiar with stability conditions, you won't be surprised by this, is that essentially the abelian category doesn't change along this wall. So what happens is, as you move along this wall, um, your destabilizing, your semi-stable objects and your destabilizing semi-stable objects, they lie in that crazy abelian category I described for all B and W along this wall. And that abelian category I described depended on B. And the fact that you lie in that abelian category down here and up here gives you inequalities on your two-term complexes of sheaves. And that's what's used. Those plus the bogomolov gizek inequality are enough to prove this control that the worst destabilization you get is this. The only time you get complexes is this. And the rest of the time you only get sheaves. All right. Any questions about that? I realize, you know, I didn't really give you many details, but. Okay, and then I just fly through for the last two minutes. I just fly through. Uh, we've got down to rank zero now. Now I wanna to go to rank minus one. Okay, so we just do the same thing again. We take a section, but now because E is rank zero, this is not an injection. So we don't take the co-kernel, we take the cone. In other words, we take this complex. <laughs> This is no longer quasi-isomorphic to a sheaf. You can't just take it. It has co-kernel and kernel, all right? But we just do the same thing again. We E is a rank zero sheaf and F is now a non-trivial complex. And there it is, okay? And we do a very similar analysis and we study these Fs. And these also lie in our crazy abelian category. So it's all set up, it all works fine. And the Joyce song wall is just defined as before, and it gives us a relation that we want. And then we have to control the other walls. And this time the control is slightly different. Before we were able to show that on the other walls, you only got sheaves here, that's not true. What we show is that on the other walls, all the destabilizing factors, all the shrapnel um, are either rank zero sheaves or other rank minus one complexes like this F but with a certain control and the control before, remember the control was rank. Here, the control is not rank. It's this degree 
So essentially, if you think of the rank zero sheaf, you can take its support and then take the degree of that support that's here. That drops at every stage. Every, every time you split, you, you cross a wall and you split your semi-stable objects into pieces, you find those pieces have a rank zero piece with lower degree. And then there's, therefore you get a similar inequality on the degree of the rank minus one piece. And that is enough now to set up another induction. And then what you find is that you end up getting uh, a universal formula again, expressing DT invariance in terms of DT invariance counting rank minus one complexes. And then finally, what you do is you dualize those rank one complexes and shift them and you wall cross a little bit more and you show you get something called a stable pair. And after a further wall crossing done 10 years ago by Bridgeland Toda, it becomes something called, it becomes one of those ideal sheaves that I was talking about before. Uh, and so now we're just counting rank one sheaves and really curves again. We're really doing curve counting, counting in the Hilbert scheme. And so in this case, what you find is a universal formula relating rank zero to rank one. Okay, so I stop there. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'll clap for everybody and ask if there are any questions. I can ask most people. Like, so a few times you've talked about universal, some universal formula of in lower yeah. rank. What do you mean? Do you really mean like some completely universal thing? Yeah. Like another, so I'm then a bit confused because you've done this through wall crossings and it seems yeah. like each time you do a wall crossing, you're getting like a formula. And then of course you put those all together. Again. But like even the number of wall crossings, I mean, that's a prior yeah. unknown. Like, you know, there's a finite number. So why, how can you get something that's like universal and doesn't depend on the... I mean, so, you know, it's not a formula that I could give you a formula for. It's not like signing cos. <laughs> well, what do you mean by universal then? Universal over what? Over like... I mean, it, it, it just involves... Maybe a recipe would be better. I mean, it, it just involves the churn character of E, the churn classes of X, the... the um, the K the the hyperplane class H, and then it involves just um, the cohomology lattice of X and the Mukai pairing on that. So all possible um, the intersection pairing on that essentially. Oh. So all possible intersections between all classes in there, and then the formula is you know. I think so it, you're saying that. that sorry, from that ahead. data, from that data, you get every possible wall that could possibly exist, even though many yeah. of them probably don't exist. Don't exist. That's and then correct. for those, you get no contribution. So but you get a, there's, there's no that's right. So you get a countable formula. It's hideous. Yeah, okay. There's some countable polynomial and countably many variables. And absolutely, almost all of them, you need them all for the universal formula because there'll be yeah. some Calabi hour where each one lights up. Yeah, but for your given Calabi hour, only finitely many of them will be non-zero. And is it ever practical? I mean, can you ever get a number out of? Uh, not, not this... for me. But I, I could never get a number out of anything. Uh, this is not what people want. So to I certainly no one's used it. Yeah. Um, but uh, yeah, I, I consider this just a. Um, oh wait a minute, my batteries. Let me plug my computer in. Um, I consider this some kind of an abstract existence theorem rather than any pra you know a practical theorem. Any other questions for Richard? That looks not. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you. I'll end the recording. Bye-bye. All right. Stop.